everybody. It is October 22nd, 2021. I don't know where the time is going. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast. And today we are bringing you a Tales from the Heart with my special guest, Dr. Harry Lever. And we're going to be talking today about emotional wellness in HCM. And uh, good morning, Dr. Lever, and welcome to Pot. Morning. Podcast. Good morning. Okay. So before I begin on our topic, I do have just a couple of small announcements for the day. Um, later this morning, um, actually at noon, there is a public meeting for ICER, the Institute for Economic Review, um, on the drug Mavic Hampton. I will be a discussant in that uh, committee meeting or whatever they're calling it. <laughs> and part of this meeting, um, well, the whole meeting is public. Uh, the, if you wanted to make a public comment, it had to have already have been submitted, but we do have uh, patient comments from five HCMA uh, representatives uh, that come from varying perspectives of HCM care themselves, and Dr. Melinda Desai from Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Marty Marin from Tufts um, will be on the discussion panel as well. There will be um, a review of the economic value of Mavic Hampton to the HCM community. It's an important day and the report will not be issued for 30 days past today or approximately there. Uh, so if you are interested in joining, I would encourage you to go to icer.org and navigate to the HCM discussion. And they will have, I think you have to register so they have to send you a link. So do that already. It's been in a couple of newsletters. I hope people have already put this on their calendar. Um, you can you can view and then you can submit written comment after the meeting if there's something that you feel that needs to be considered in the final, final, final report. <laughs> okay, so that being said, I hope everybody enjoyed last weekend at the HCM International Summit. And if you've missed it, it's not too late. You can actually sign up and get the content for the next four months. So you can go to hcmsummit.org and sign up for that meeting and the content will be available for four months. Okay, now, Harry, sorry for the long announcement today, but it's kind of a big day. Um, after all these years of waiting for a labeled indication drug, we're, we're right at the precipice. So lots of stuff going on. All right, emotional wellness. Dr. Harry Lever, what year did you go to med school? From 1967 to 71. And back then, you were on, I'm assuming, a cardiology path, pretty much? Yep. Okay. How much education did you receive on mental health and health care of the mind? Of the I, actually, I actually, as I'm sitting here thinking, uh, I was on a psychiatric service for two months. And, uh, and we, it was mainly inpatient stuff, but a little bit of outpatient, but it was not, you know, it wasn't super in depth, but we had, did have some. And back at that time, were there any, um, there were no standardized tools to measure anxiety and depression? They hadn't been established yet? No, don't think so. Okay. And today, I know we're trying to do more to educate young physicians about assessing mental health and making sure those referrals are done. But there's still a lot of guys and ladies and people out there who have received their training in a time where there wasn't a lot of education. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's probably true. But, but you know, one of the problems also that we've got to be careful about is that subspecialties tend to get separated. You know, everybody tends to be in their own little uh, barrel. You know, and they're, they're kind of, uh, the specialties don't always cross as good as they should. And this is a very big challenge in healthcare today, right? right? We have limited time with whatever the practitioner is and subspecialty care tends to focus on their subspecialty for obvious reasons. So there is a chance that stress anxiety, depression can get overlooked if we're not having the conversation. Would that be correct? Yep. So how do you, or how did you address such issues 
in your practice or, did, well, or now? Well, we, we always took time and talked to the patient and tried to get an idea of what was going on and, and try to, you know, sort of try to, and in some situations, try to reassure them that, you know, uh, we, you know, we were trying to help them out and try we, that we had a good chance to make them feel better from a cardiac point of view. And, but, but, you know, we talk, talk, you know, try to talk to them about their anxieties and also that as well. Um, and one thing that I always did was I tried not to delay the care of patients so that they didn't have so much time to worry about it. For instance, if somebody was going to need heart surgery, I'd, if, I'd try to always get it done in a reasonable period of time so that there was not a lot of time to think about it. I think that's very wise. And, the more we get in our head about the what ifs, there's no benefit there. No. And one, one patient I was so worried about one time, he didn't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but he had coronary artery disease. And I was really concerned about him. And he said, well, I'm going home. I said, no, you're not. Can't let you do that. And I took his shoes away from him. So he couldn't walk out of the office just so that we could get going quickly. So that, it, that idea of sitting there and stewing about it just doesn't work. And that can create more anxiety and more, more stress on top of the stress. Right. I think that's a unique approach, taking away the slippers. I'm not sure that would fly today. Well. It worked. It was effective. It worked. It worked. That's right. That's adorable. Okay. So in terms of HCM patients, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a loaded question. Do HCM patients have a right to feel a little stressed beyond the average bear, or are they, they shouldn't stress out about their diagnosis at all? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know that it's any more than any other disease. I mean, anybody that gets a problem with themselves, you know, they're going to get stressed out. Uh, one problem may be that they may not be, the Hocum patients may not have have had the chance to get the information that they need to, you know, because a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of physicians that don't understand it and maybe they wasn't explained right and all those sorts of things. And, and you know, there's more things we can do for high patients than in the past. And if you're not really tuned into the disease, you, you know, you may not have all the answers. So that, that can make people more anxious. So not having access to information, in your opinion, makes patients anxious right? because they don't know. There's a lot of what ifs. Right. So we've been trying to fight that problem for 25 years now. <laughs> and we know that once we do engage somebody and they get to go through the process of an intake call and a navigation call and maybe participation in a discussion group or two, that their anxiety level drops a bit. They understand what they can manage. They start creating a plan not only for their physical well-being, but their support network and their support mechanisms, including a lot of the services that we provide here at the HCMA. What else do you think patients, when they're stressing out, how should they talk to their cardiologists? How should they engage other healthcare providers to help them through that anxiety? Well, I mean, it's just a matter of letting people know how you feel and what you're worried about. And I think, you know, um, a matter of letting the physician know that you're worried. I mean, and, and, you know, and it's also the physician's responsibility to try to, you know, talk to people not only about their chest pain and shortness of breath, but how are they doing otherwise? And um, many times though, when you're taking the history and all that, that stuff does come out, you know, and it, it's just a matter of, you know, you know, trying to take the time to get it out. Agree. <laughs> What do you think if a patient wanted to try an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication, should they be in touch with their cardiologist to double check that it's the right medication for them? Or should they just treat it as a silo and not discuss it with the other specialists? Well, I think that they should talk to us about it. But at the same time, I think that uh, we have to realize that We've had minimal training in psychiatry and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, probably refer them to a psychiatrist to uh, 
to get some medication, but that requires that the cardiologist talk to the psychiatrist so that there's a clear understanding about the, that some of these drugs may have vasodilator effects or drop the blood pressure. And they have to, you know, you have to make sure they're aware also. One of the other interesting things that has happened, I think, in psychiatry is there's, there is the psychiatrist, but then there's the referral to the psychologist. Psychologists don't write for drugs and psychiatrists do. So it, there may be two people on the other side that they're dealing with the patient. And, and you know, uh, sometimes psychiatrists may not take quite the time that the psychologist does to sit down and talk to the patient as well. So it's, you gotta sort of know who's on the team. And, well, I'm gonna let you know, interesting. The team is changing a little bit. Uh, currently in, I think it's five states. I could be wrong on that number, but New Jersey is definitely one of them. Psychologists can take a course. One second, Lisa, Lisa, I'm losing connection here. Hold on one second. Okay. Psychologists can now take a course to um, prescribe medications. Um, I have a family member who's in one of the programs right now, and I think she'll be done in like a year and a half, but you might find in the future, psychologists might be able to prescribe depending upon state. Um, so, but generally speaking, they're going to talk things out with you and you could also use the services of a therapist as well. What other <clears throat> techniques or skills have you or the Cleveland Clinic used for stress management in HCM? I know back in 2006, when my dad had his surgery at Cleveland Clinic, he was given guided meditation, CDs and music right, and right. stress relievers such as that. Um, right. Does it have value? Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. And, and you know, and if I saw that I, we were having particular trouble with a patient, we'd make a psychiatric consult in the hospital, if they were in the hospital, in the hospital, you know, or, and there was one particular psychiatrist that was pretty tuned into heart disease and, and I referred them that guy is a leo right yeah right he's a good guy yeah so if a patient is feeling stressed depressed anxious they should not feel stigmatized to say i feel anxious i feel stressed i feel no. uh -oh. nobody's gonna look down upon them or see in any negative light whatsoever are they no nope. no nope. i don't think so and it's perfectly okay to reach out for help and say, I'm having a hard time right now. Right. I think they should. And that is part of the reason we created the discussion group community to complement that physician office visit and that contact with the physician's office to help patients feel connected to each other, uh, to the disease, to understand it better and to understand when to act and when they can be reassured. And that I think is, you know, kind of the message of the month. So um, we have, we had two messages for the month that was emotional wellness and finding help. So, you know, there are other organizations that run other kind of support systems, whether they be faith-based, whether they be spiritually based, whether they be community based, it's about building a network. And yesterday I was reading through some articles on mental health. And in, in all good timing, uh, a couple of days ago, the American Heart published an article about another barrier for Black and Hispanic people is good mental health. So we're now dealing with, you know, if you are of the Black and Brown community, uh, I'm, I'm concerned if you also have HCM, because there's less likely chance that you're going to get the mental health services that you may want or need. Um, and this is another area of health equity that, you know, we're going to be definitely looking at much more closely. We're building a committee right now on health equity for the HCMA that'll take off next uh, um, quarter. Actually, it'll, it'll launch in January of 2022. Um, but we need to identify those who are at the highest risk of mental illness on top of their HCM. And we have to reach out to them. But I'm saying this next statement with a few people in mind, and if you're one of them, you probably know that you are. There are people within our community that need help. We know that. 
but you have to reach out and show up to a meeting. You have to reach out for the help and then take the action to go get it. We can make things available and you can say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that. But you have to actually do the work and you have to talk to a therapist potentially, or you have to meet a psychiatrist to get on the right meds. It's important. Your mental health is as important as your cardiac health and they, and they feed off of each other as well. So, um, Harry, have you ever had a problem where a patient wanted to get mental health services, but was just afraid to say the words? And is there anything that you can offer them to help them make that first? I mean, I, I just think if you, if you see that somebody is particularly anxious, you know, you got to sense that and, and tell them that, you know, if it seems like the symptoms are way out of line from what you think they ought to be, that may be a sign of extreme anxiety and you need to talk about that. But the other, the other issue, of course, is that you got to make sure that the patient's being treated properly for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so that you might take away some of that anxiety if they're feeling a little, if you can make them feel somewhat better. That, that also is a, is a problem if they're, you know, if they were thought, if, if, for instance, somebody thought they had asthma and they were being treated for asthma instead of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and weren't getting better, well, that causes anxiety. So, you, you know, you, you know, that, that's part of the deal is you, you need to make sure that the patient's getting the right, right medical device, medical advice and make sure that they're on that, that side of it. I completely agree. Let, let's take a dive down how stress can trigger HCM and vice versa. I call it the cat chasing its tail. So we all get a little nervous sometimes and our heart rate kicks up a few beats. But in HCM, we may feel those beats much more forcefully right. or they may be PVCs, premature ventricular contractions that we're a little off on timing. Right. And that scares us. And that drops more adrenaline, which makes your heart race a little faster. And then you say, oh my God, something's really wrong now. And then you turn the corner again and you're like, oh, oh my God, I'm scared. This is, this heart is not happy. So you just keep the adrenaline going. You have to learn where those triggers are. And this probably took me 20 years of my life to figure out, oh, this is what's happening here. I'm feeding this and you have to stop and you have to breathe and you have to remind yourself that you're safe and you breathe through it. And then the anxiety comes down and then the physical comes back into line. You need to, if this resonates with you, you need to discuss this with your healthcare providers because maybe a little beta blocker or calcium channel blocker is going to help blunt those symptoms. And then maybe the anxiety will dissipate as well because the trigger for your anxiety is calmed down. So they play against each other and they play with each other. Does that make sense, Harry? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a frequent thing that you see in HCM, right? Oh, yeah. And if somebody is, some of us are more sensitive to adrenaline than others. Like some of us can handle a roller coaster and some people should not do roller coasters. <laughs> so you want to have good stress and you want to make sure that your heart can handle good stress as well as bad stress. And you have to learn how to break those cycles. And we've had these discussions in discussion groups. I've probably talked to 5,000, 6,000 people about this very issue over the years. Um, but I think it's very real. And I think we need to appreciate that it happens and that we can use just a couple of deep breaths to break the anxiety. Find another trigger that you can focus on whatever it is, watch silly TikTok videos for a few minutes and get your brain out of it and just disengage or whatever. Um, but I think you have to notice where those triggers are for you and learn how to balance them. Does that always require cardiac or just um, psychotropic medications? Is it no, Xanax it, or is it a beta blocker? Well, I think you have to, uh, you know, you just sort of have to see how things are going for the patient and decide how bad off they seem, whether you need drugs or not. Again, because drugs have side effects and in some, some of them, you've got to be really careful when you have a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, particularly if they have outflow tract obstruction. So, 
you know, you just, that's, it's just a matter of the cardiologist decision to where to proceed, you know, whether, you know, go to the psychiatrist or, you know, try a little bit of sedation or something like that, but it's, you know, you got to think about it. So we had a discussion group the other day and we talked about, um, um, meditation and breathing techniques. And I have to say, I found this a bit later in life. I found this after my transplant more so than before. I had tried it before, but it didn't click with me. But whether you want to call it meditation, mindfulness, or just focused breathing, like those other words sound kind of heady and new agey, focused breathing, a couple of deep breaths in, a moment of stillness, just to kind of reconnect with yourself. It doesn't have to be like a 20 minute excursion. It can literally be 20 seconds. And sometimes it's all you need to bring yourself back to balance. So HCM or not HCM, I think it's kind of a, a critical point. Anyway, Harry, what else do you have to say about mental health and HCM? Well, I just think it's, it's something that has to be thought about. And I think that it it does take time. And I think doctors have to be aware that there is something going on with the patient and not just pass it off. Oh, he's just a kook. You know, you don't, you don't want to do that. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's, that's what's important is recognizing, you know, what's all going on with the patient. And sometimes, sometimes, you know, it, there are family issues that, that mix in as well. And you've got to be aware of that. You know, are there, is there something going on in the family that's raising stress? And, you know, you got to find out, got to find out some of that too. And I think that, and, you know, one thing that I always tried to make sure when I see a patient was I'd have a husband or wife in the room together. I, so I could see what the interaction was. I didn't, I didn't like seeing patients by themselves. I would always have some the other, the other side of, you know, the husband or the wife in, in the room with me so that we could better see what, looking eye to eye. And you can hear uh, the support system. It's a, it's a positive eyeball sign. You have to, you have to be aware of what else is going on. And, you know, and I guess over the years, you built up a lot of intuition about that, haven't you? Right, 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 right. So um, it's, it's just, that's, that's really important. That's probably one of the most important things is because sometimes what happens is the, the patient is denying what's going on and the spouse says, oh, wait a minute here. There's some other things going on he's not telling you about, like he's drinking too much alcohol and they didn't tell you or something like that because alcohol and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they don't mix too well. They need to know about those sort of things. And you'd be surprised what I found out about that. Or, you know, they minimize the amount of beer that they drink. Well, a bottle of beer is a shot and a half of whiskey. That's a lot. And, and you know, some people just to take relieve their stress are drinking alcohol. And you got you to gotta be really aware of that, again, because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and alcohol don't mix well. Because it causes a vasodilation yeah, and you right. can drop pressures. Well, it also causes atrial fibrillation if it's too much. Mm -hmm. So that's something that has to always be talked about. And, you know, that's why. You know, I think, I think that tying into the emotional wellness conversation is the, con the, the concept of self-medication through alcohol, through nicotine, through uh, THC and cannabis products. Now, yeah, I think right. there are, there are benefits to things that relieve stress, but there's also a consequence right. that the short-term benefit may not be the long-term benefit. So each situation needs to be evaluated very carefully. Um, Harry and I have disagreed on this. I had HCM for 36 years and I have had alcohol. Um, early on when I was very obstructed, I hated it. It made me feel terrible. But later when my heart changed a little bit, I didn't feel terrible, but I wasn't like a big drinker. Uh, a drink and a half is a lot for me. Um, all right, two drinks last weekend, but that's a whole other story. Um, it's not about 
denying yourself of something. It's about being balanced. So if you are having a drink to be social, make sure you're drinking enough water and you're balancing that. But if you're going to drugs and alcohol for stress reduction, you really need to stop and think about how you're reducing your stress because you're stressing your body out with the chemicals and you're not stressing, you know, you're not de-stressing your mind. Um, Harry, can you talk a little bit about the impact on the heart from nicotine itself? What does nicotine do to, to the heart rate and blood pressure? Well, it probably it increases the heart rate. And, and I think that the other thing that's more important in a way is what it does to your lungs. And that's bad. And I think that, you know, we've got to, people have, can't smoke when they're when they're because it raises another problem in there with uh, uh, you know with the, with the heart putting pressure on the lungs and then smoking and getting the lungs inflamed that's a bad combination and one of the problems that we have is that the medications that we use at times to treat the lungs is detrimental to the heart as we have to use uh, you know, pulmonary dilators and those can increase the heart rate and things like that so. You really don't want to be smoking. That that can that can really um, cause a really bad problem. I, I will tell a couple of quick stories on smoking and HCM. I, I, I understand it's very difficult to quit, and we're not smoke shaming anybody. It's an addiction. It needs to be broken. Um, but if you're taking drugs to lower your heart rate and help your heart relax while smoking cigarettes. You're, you're kind of coming at it from two different angles. So you're doing something to slow your heart down and let it relax. And then the nicotine is kicking up your heart rate and making it go faster and potentially harder. So you're, you're taking drugs and you're taking another drug that counteracts that drug. So it's kind of silly to spend your money on meds and cigarettes simultaneously because it's a zero balance. Right. Um, would that be correct, Harry? Yeah, I think so. So really, really, really important that if you do have HCM and, and smoking is your stress reliever, I, I'm going to share a story. Harry doesn't know this one yet. Um, happened earlier this year, a uh, woman I spoke to, um, obviously from the phone call was a very heavy smoker and heading to myectomy. Um, we begged her to stop smoking. She didn't stop smoking. She smoked literally to the hospital door. They were never able to extubate her after her myectomy. She did not die from HCM. She did not die from the myectomy. She died because her lungs could not come off the ventilator. And what a waste. What a sad, sad situation. And I, you know, I mourn for her, but I use her story to educate you. It's not, <laughs> smoking isn't just a little something. It's, it does a lot of damage. So, uh, can, I, can I call you back in about 20 minutes? Thanks, bye. Okay. So um, we just want to make sure that you find other mechanisms to relieve stress. Yep. Any, any alternative therapies for stress reduction that you believe in, Harry? Well, I think it's one of the other things is to occupy your time with things that you like to do. So that you have something else to think about. Have a hobby or something like that that you get interested in. Gives you another group of people you can talk to about things. And I think, you find focus. Right, right. And I think that's that's important. And you, you don't wanna you don't wanna have your mind on things all, just concentrating on yourself without having some diversions. You need to have some diversions. So and, Kim and, just posted that she likes walking. Like yeah. walking is her therapy. Right. right. And I think that one of the important things with walking is get yourself some sort of device that tells you how much you're walking. Yep. Right. And I think th those sorts of things have become extremely valuable. But no matter which kind you get, it tells you what you're doing. So Fitbit, Apple Watch, right. Right. Sense, right. Uh, whatever. Um, right. I think they're all amazing devices. I'm still trying to figure out how to use the EKG thing on the Sense Fitbit. But um, I, that's, I think that's a new, that's a, that's one of the newer ones. That's the newest one. And I, I honestly, it just came out. I don't, I don't know that Fitbit is keeping up with some of the other technologies. I think they're a little bit behind, but 
Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. Matt, how, Matt. how long does it record for? I don't know. I haven't been able to get it to work yet. I see. I just had to get a replacement because my battery died. So I, I will I will report back when I figure out how to do the Fitbit Sense EKG and if I think it's user friendly or not. Um, I love the Alive Core, um, the Cardia Monitor. Right. right. Um, I think they did a fantastic job with the platform, the technology. Um, it's it's amazing the clarity of that uh, EKG rhythm. So very very well done. If anybody has any questions or comments about things that they've used for mental health wellness, um, any other resources that you've used that are helpful, we're happy to communicate those out to the audience. Uh, I think it's critical to understand that we're all in this together, and the only way we're going to learn more about the interaction between our mental health and our and our HCM hearts is is to talk about it more and to document better how those two aspects of our lives are, are working together. So, and I don't know if I have any other questions out there. Harry, any other thoughts on the topic? No, I think we've kind of covered uh, pretty much. And I think the one thing you just said about this, this device, wearing the device is actually can be a stress reliever because you start feeling some racing of your heart and it may not be what you think it is. It may just be a little bit of a sinus tachycardia. It's not a bad rhythm. And one of the major advantages of it is that many of them you can email to your doctor. So he can take a quick look at it and you can be taught even to see what it looks like and quickly relieve those thoughts. Because what happens is if you think it's something bad and you worry about it, well, it's whatever the rate is, it's gonna get worse. And so it, it's helpful to know what you're dealing with. And it's like, it's like having the doctor sitting next to you. That ought to relieve some anxiety. You can, quick, you can quickly see what the rhythm is. And I, I think that there's, that's a major, you know, major thing. And then for the doctor, it's helpful to see, you know, what's really going on with this patient when they say they're having something. And then you say, well, that's nothing to worry about. You know, that rhythm is just fine. Or if it is atrial fibrillation or something like that, well, we got to treat it. And I, I have a story of a guy who early on in the pandemic lived in New Jersey and he had non-obstructive hokum and, uh, and some coronary disease. And he, he called into the clinic in the middle of the night and he, uh, he uh, it looked like he was having atrial fibrillation because he had an alive core and the, the guy in the, um, that answered the phone could see it. And I got the message, you know, shortly thereafter, and we talked about it. And I told told the patient, "Well, yeah, I really ought to go to the hospital." And he he didn't want to go because it was early in the pandemic, and he was really afraid to go to the emergency room. So we talked about it, and it turns out he had been on amiodarone. And I never thought I would do something like this. I I had him send me the rhythm again. He was indeed in atrial fibrillation. And we started him back on the amio, and within 12 hours, he was in sinus rhythm. So we saved a lot of, it's not something I would always do, but in that situation where we were stuck with a very anxious patient and somebody who didn't want to go get help, and you could understand why at that time, because there was no vaccines or anything like that. And, you know, we treated him. And boy, was I happy in 12 hours to see he was back in sinus rhythm. And I could see it. So that, that that kind of stuff cannot be minimized, you know, and, you know, and you have to, you know, but the other thing is it, it take, you know, it's kind of thing where, where from the physician's point of view, if you're not, if you're, if patients seem to be anxious, you got to pick up on that and sit down and talk to them about it and see, go in a little more into their, what's going on in their family? Are they having financial troubles or is there some other thing that's going on so that you can you know, look into really what's going on? You know, sometimes you know, there are all kinds of things that can go on and you, anything you can do to relieve that is helpful. Life is complicated. Yeah, you know, well, it's gotten more complicated, hasn't it? That it has. Yeah. Okay, well, we're gonna wrap up here because I have to get off to the ICER meeting to do the Economic review of Mavic Hampton, everybody send me strong energy so that we have a, a report that actually is meaningful to the community. 
Um, so uh, we're going to do that a little bit later. Uh, stay tuned for more information there. I do want to make one final announcement for today. Um, and I'm happy to say that Dr. Lever is a partner in this project as well. In a couple of days, we're going to be launching something called HCM Academy. This is an opportunity for your healthcare providers to get some HCM education. I'm going to be doing a full presentation on it soon. But right now, if you want to sneak on over to the HCMA website and you can look up uh, HCM Academy and our programs, you will have the opportunity to refer your own physicians to HCM Academy. Your local doctor, your pediatrician, the guy at the ER that you see all the time, we're going to give you an opportunity to, to either give them the web address or you can get their information and register them and we'll communicate with them directly. So start going back to your doctor's offices and getting some email addresses and getting their addresses already. And you can help us educate your physicians right where they live, online courses and one hour discussion groups and education with some of our leaders. Um, this is a partnership um, with HCMA and PCM Scientific. Uh, I am a faculty member along with Marty Marin, Anjali Owens and John Lynn Jeffries. And then we have regional directors and then we have regional educators. And we are going to hopefully reach, we're hoping for 10,000 healthcare providers by May. So start sending in your names and uh, we'll start those invites going out. Uh, this is, um, we've heard of bootstrap epidemiology. This is bootstrap in uh, medical education. <laughs> we're just going right out to the community and patients, you're gonna help us educate your physicians and we're gonna build a stronger and safer world for people with HCM. Dr. Lever, thank you as always for joining us and I'm out. Take care, right. everybody. Take it easy, bye. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Heart. For more information on HCM, we encourage you to visit our website at 4hcm.org. Join us online for the conversation on our Facebook page or in our private group. Facebook page can be found at Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And our Instagram handle is at 4hcmwarriors. That's the number 4hcmwarriors. Follow us on Twitter at 4hcm.org. For those members of the LinkedIn community, you may want to follow the conversation on the Hypotrophic Cardiomyopathy Association group. Join us today. To contact the Hypotrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, you can call 973-983-7429. You can email us at support at 4hcm.org or visit us online at our website, 4hcm.org, and send us an email from there. The Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association is located in New Jersey and operates on East Coast time. We would like to thank our sponsors, Myocardia, Invite, Boston Scientific, and Cytokinetics for their support of this program. The HCMA is partnering with Myocardia, 23andMe, and others to help learn more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Learn more about these initiatives at 4hcm.org. Invite, a genetic testing company and a sponsor of Tales from the Heart, is proud to provide free genetic testing to families with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Please learn more at 4hcm.org. Hey, we know life with HCM can be challenging, and support is critical. That's why the HCMA has created an online support group system to help you and your loved ones live better with HCM. Join us. The HCMA is seeking volunteers on a number of different projects, including our online support group system, our peer-to-peer, big-hearted friend system, and our legislative subcommittee. Please visit 4hcm.org to learn more today.